Thanks for joining us for this episode of Got Your Six Lad Advice Encounters with me, Gav Topoli, and friends. I'm delighted today to be joined by Chris Dorr QC. Chris is a lawyer who made his name as a criminal defence barrister, taking on several high profile cases before taking silk and becoming a QC or Queen's Counsel. Chris is also a writer, broadcaster, and legal commentator. He appears on the BBC TV show Crime Are We Tough Enough? and his book Justice on Trial is out now. Thanks for joining us, Chris, and welcome to the podcast. No problem. Good to meet you. And you too. Finally, it's been a a long time coming. Um, I wonder if we could start at the very beginning and talk a bit about how you ended up in the situation you're in now. So sort of, you know, what you did going through school, how you got into law and and how you ended up as a QC. Well, I was was, was thinking when you asked how I ended up here now, that's what most people ask when someone's in prison. That's the first thing I say to (laughs) them. You tell me how you ended up here. Uh, So how did I end up where I am? Uh, Well, I went to, uh, I grew up in uh, Milton Keynes. I went to uh, uh, just state schools, a very ordinary comprehensive school in in Milton Keynes um, and probably wouldn't have got very far if it weren't for random chance, which... My, my parents moved um, up north to just north of Liverpool when I was 16, just after I did my O-levels and didn't do very well in them. Um, and, um, and it just so happened that they moved quite close to a really good sixth form college. Um, and, and so hence, just by sheer chance and sheer geography, uh, I ended up going to a really good sixth form college and, and for the first time really um, was sort of engaged with my education and really enjoyed the, the subjects enjoyed the way that it was taught and, and it was an environment where education was, you know, something that was valued, um, yeah. which hadn't been the case in my kind of earlier education. So it was just sheer chance, really. And then, um, as some people may know, if they've, if they've seen any of the stuff I've done on TV, um, what, what the kind of there was another random chance, which is that one day I went along to the career centre at, um, at the Sixth Form College and I did one of these computer careers tests where you you know, answer questions about what sort of things you like, what you think you're good at and what you don't like and so on. And basically it said that there are only two jobs that I could possibly do. One was barrister and one was the actor. Um, okay. so, yeah. So from there, I, I you know, I, 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 I set about finding out what each of those two careers uh, involved. And, um, and that took me to uh, Liverpool Crown Court where I sat in the gallery and watched a few trials over over the summer holidays in between my sort of first and second year of A level, um, and you know I just absolutely fell in love with the whole thing. I watched trials, I watched the barristers doing their speeches, and you know I just found the whole thing completely intoxicating and and really quite addictive. And so I became utterly obsessed with it from that point onwards. So that was I would have been sixteen, seventeen at the time, seventeen, just turned seventeen, and you know I was just, just absolutely kind of totally addicted to this whole kind of thing the drama the theater the you know and the fact that you get to listen to the sound of your own voice all day every day which is not <laughs> a struggle with. it's interesting that you say that they, they said actor uh or barrister and then you were talking about sort of the drama and the theater and i guess there's a, a, a sort of a confidence in the performative aspect to the to the role really yeah, there is. And, and, you know, I think I think it's like acting with 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 sort of bells on it, if you like, because, you know, uh, you know, we, we, we there is an element of drama and there is, of course, an element of performance about what we do in court. But but there's a lot riding on it. You know, I mean, you don't you know, someone may not get to go home for a very long time if, if things go a certain way. Um, so I think I think, you know, undoubtedly, you know, a, difference i suppose is that there are, there are much more strict rules about what we can and can't say and and that kind of thing but but within reason yeah you can you can let loose a little bit of your kind of performance side if you have one and um you know and, and criminal law in particular is and, and criminal advocacy and jury trials are if, you know if you're going to bring that kind of side of your personality and your perhaps your skill set into play in the workplace then then absolutely, um, you know, criminal advocacy and jury trials are the place to, to, to do a bit of amateur dramatics, although hopefully less of the amateur. <laughs> so I wonder if you could just talk us through sort of a, a bit more step by step that process, because I know certainly since I put the post on the group and, and I think you're aware of the, the Lads Advice Group that the, the podcast came yeah. from, a couple of our members uh, have expressed an interest in certainly in law uh, and, and perhaps in, in being called to the bar. And I know that at least a couple of those are young men who are doing A-levels or at university and also the first generation. So they've got no family history uh, and have had pretty little advice about, you know, what the prospects are and, and how to how to follow that path. Could you maybe offer some sort of step-by-step advice on that? 
Yeah, of course. I mean, I was in the same boat as, as, as you will have gathered from what, I, what I've just said. So I, ca- I completely understand that it can seem quite intimidating, the idea of getting into a profession. If you, you know, if you don't have a family background, you know, like me, I didn't even have anyone in my family who'd been to university before, let alone kind of got into one of the, the, the kind of major professions, if you like. So, so I understand that completely. I, th- I think the answer is you just have to, you have to try and get as much exposure to it as you can. So I mentioned earlier, I went to court and watch cases. That's the best way. Way, particularly you know if you if, if if someone's sort of uh you know already uh, a fair way into their education um it's the best way to, to to really get firsthand what this job's all about and really to start to be able to build a bit of knowledge because um you know you, if you're going to go you know for example you're going to apply to do part-time jobs in, or work experience in law firms or mini pupillages in chambers all of which are really important again as part of that learning process you know you've got really got to be able to demonstrate why you know you stand out from the crowd you know why you know there are hundreds of young people in particular applying for these you know experiences and training programs and so on yeah um but you know many of them are kind of pretty much very similar applications so i think what we're looking for when we're when we're looking at those applications is you know what's someone done that maybe is to go a bit out of their way to 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 use their own initiative to show you know that they really do understand what it's about and and i and going to court is a brilliant way to do that because it's free and it's that it's open all day every day in the week and anybody can go so you know students in particular who have holidays for several weeks or even months at a time there's really no excuse for not going to court and and that doesn't just mean going to the criminal courts or you know which is my kind of background and my my profession but but you know there are many other kinds of courts that you can visit you know there are criminal courts there are civil courts there are family courts uh, there are appeal courts particularly in london um you can you can i mean and if you go to the royal courts of justice on the strand there's even like a mini museum in there which kind of gives you loads of information and all of that is completely free. So yeah. I think I think take advantage of what is free. You know, take advantage of all of the content. I mean, I have a YouTube channel. There's actually ten or eleven videos on there which I made during lockdown, which are intended to the, for those who are looking at a legal career. So you know, anyone who wants to, you know, there's a, they explain about interviews, applications, you know, also work experience, and I also deal with that issue of, of if you come from a perhaps a non-traditional background and how you come over, overcome some of those barriers. So uh, at least even if the barriers are only in your own head, you know, which often they are. So, so, you know, there's lots of information out there, but, but the other thing I would say is it does no harm. You know, if you, if you're interested in a legal career and, and some of your listeners are, then, then, you know, to Google around, find the sorts of lawyers that you think, oh, you know, that's the kind of lawyer I want to be. And just send them an email and say, would you give me half an hour on zoom just to have a chat about what you do? Because, you know, they, some may say no, but you know, a significant number may say yes, and once again, you, it shows initiative. It shows that you're you're doing the right things to get the sort of information that you need to make proper judgments. You know, some people have an idea about legal practice, which is totally different to reality. So the more you've kind of looked into it and found out what it's really about, the more you can demonstrate when you make applications that you you know you, you're the, the right kind of candidate because you've been careful and thoughtful about your kind of your your your, your career intentions, and you you know you you really do have a passion for it. Because I, I think uh, above all else, if you don't really have a passion to get into law, particularly criminal law, I just don't think you're going to make it because there's so much competition to get into the job and into the profession that you really have to be able to demonstrate that you're completely committed to it and 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 also why you're committed to it. I think that's really useful. And particularly one of the, the young men that I was speaking to today, um, I know he wasn't aware he could do A-levels anywhere apart from his school. Uh, and then he thought, well, maybe politics. And then as he's gone through his A-levels, he's decided on law. Uh, and we did speak about that, that idea of going into the court. And he, he, was, he was not aware that, that was something that was possible. So I think uh, definitely the videos that you've got on YouTube would be useful. Um, how do you go about finding those? Is there, is there a link uh, for those? Just, or... My YouTube channel is Crystal QC. So just, just search Crystal QC on YouTube and uh, hopefully it will pop up. I don't think there's any other Crystal QC on, on YouTube. So you should find me. Perfect. And so in terms of criminal law, um, what was the, was it always going to be criminal law or did you go and study law at university and then the decision came later through experience or, or you know, or, or practice or what, what happened? It's interesting. So, so for me, it was always criminal law. I think for, for a number of reasons, firstly, because, you know, I think my personality probably quite suited to it, you know, in terms of public speaking, but also, you know, coming from a a background, you know, uh, you know, a very sort of ordinary background, going to a very kind of ordinary state school, 
I think, you know, there's a certain life experience that you get from that background, which is perhaps, you know, more, more gives you more insight into the behavior of those young people who may get in trouble, because some people like at school got into trouble, and, and some of the sort of social factors involved in, uh, in, in, in the backgrounds of those who become embroiled in the criminal justice system. So, you know, some of my friends were, you know, had had really difficult backgrounds. Some of their parents were in, in trouble with police or even went to prison in some cases. I'm sure. sure that kind of background really was helpful. I mean, at the time I didn't know it, but then there came that sort of watershed moment that I described of watching criminal law in action in court. And, and it was really at that point, I never even thought about entering another form of legal practice, certainly not for the for many years after that. And, and by, you know, I went right the way through, um, you know, university, uh, focusing on cr criminal subjects where I could, criminology as an option, and, and all of the subjects, the law of evidence that were that, that was that were around um, criminal practice. And then when I went on to do the bar exams later, once again I was looking at doing mini pupillage and so on with criminal chambers, um, and I was utterly focused on criminal law. But but many, I have to say, and there may be you know listeners uh, thinking to themselves, well, I'm not quite that. I don't really know yet. I just have a a general idea that I want to do law, that's completely normal. No, no one needs to you know, feel that they have to have a, a clear idea of what they want to do when they're 16 or 18, or even once they're at, at, at university doing law, because I think many people don't make those decisions until they come up to leaving university. Um, so I think it's, it's different for everyone, but, but I think the more that people explore the profession in all of its different varieties, the more likely they're, they will hit upon the area of the, of the specialism that's most suited to them. You know, some people are incredibly academic and, and you know, it may even be in some cases that people study law and decide that they want to teach law, you know, as a mm -hmm. career, an academic legal career. You know, so there's a whole spectrum, you know, you could argue that at one end of the spectrum is criminal barrister, which is probably the most well known in terms of the public kind of perception of law because of TV dramas and, and everything else, but actually represents a very, very small proportion of the total number of lawyers who are yeah. actively involved in criminal advocacy, particularly jury advocacy on a daily basis. You know, it's probably 5% of the profession and yet in the media, it's 80% almost. So, so you know, I think people will need to really understand that the law is, is a, a very diverse uh, profession very diverse subject matter, and just find the thing that uh, that appeals to their interests and their and their and their qualities and and and, and skill set. Hmm. And I, you know, you're at the sort of the top of your field, really, in terms of criminal law, and then you've gone on to be a QC. There's lots of critiques, uh, including coming from yourself and others, both around paying conditions for for criminal lawyers and also for the the justice system itself. Do you think? That that's causing a problem at the moment in attracting sort of quality criminal barristers, and if so, how do we address that? Oh, it absolutely is. So, so when I started out, criminal law was probably the most popular mm. uh, area of practice for aspiring barristers, uh, partly because of you know it's so well known, and and it's many people assume that you know everybody who's a barrister must do criminal law. Of course, that's not true. But 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 I, you know it was undoubtedly the most popular area when I started out, and there were very many pupillages available in criminal law. Uh, they were still oversubscribed in terms of numbers, but nowhere near as much as today but then a number of things happened in have happened in the time since i qualified in the mid 1990s um, mm. which have completely shifted the sands in a different direction so um first of all we have um uh, we, we we saw a very significant drop in the the amount of money paid for criminal advocacy uh, which meant that by the government in effect for legal aid and prosecution work which which meant that criminal chambers became uh, came under enormous financial pressure so they were less able to fund um, pupil barristers through their pupillages. Secondly, uh, it became a compulsory requirement to fund pupillages. So when I started out, there were unfunded pupillages. And indeed, I had an unfunded pupillage, which meant that you didn't get any money at all mm. unless and until you were into your second six months and you could go to court and earn money for fees. Yeah. Nowadays, in, in an effort to try and you know level the playing field, I suppose, in terms of sure. social mobility, chambers yeah. got to fund their pupils even in the first six months now, that's a good thing for the pupils, but the problem is when you're in an era of shrinking revenues for chambers, what that means, yeah. the consequence of that is, 
is that chambers that may have offered 10 or eight or five pupillages uh, in the past will say, okay, well, we, we can't afford to fund 10 people and we're only going to likely take on a couple at the end of it. So they're just shrinking the numbers. So, sure. so unfortunately, that those sorts of pressures are there. And I think also the publicity around cuts and the general state of the justice system uh, has meant that in particular, those who have the really top academic grades, so those who went to Oxbridge or the top sort of Russell Group universities with really good grades, particularly in law, you know, they're heavily recruited by city firms who will pay very large sums to recruit outstanding candidates and criminal chambers just can't compete financially with those offers. I mean, some of them, are, you know, American firms, for example, are paying trainee solicitors 100 grand a year as a yeah. trainee, someone just out of law school and criminal chambers can't remotely compete with that. So, so I think there has been a, there's been a natural competitive um, kind of shift, if you like, where, where the, the brightest students, many of those would still have had ambitions to be criminal barristers 30 or 25 years ago, it's very difficult. You know, it, I have to say, particularly if they come from backgrounds where they may not be so financially advantaged, it's yeah. quite difficult to, to turn down 100 grand a year as a trainee and take the chance that you may not even make it through pupillage. And if you do, you could be on 20 grand a year for two or three years. You know, there's a big, you know, the, the, what we're asking of young people is to make a huge number of sacrifices if they're going to become criminal barristers, when what we should be doing as a society is incentivizing the brightest and the best, because you know we should be placing strategic importance on our justice system. The truth is, it's the opposite. You know, the justice system is the poor relation of the public sector. It's been cut more than any other government department 10 years or so and it's on its knees financially and it's on its knees in so many other ways you know huge delays and backlogs in the court system so i think there's a whole range of factors that are quite off-putting to young people in particular um who are who, who who maybe you know deep down would love to be a criminal barrister but they just see all these practical obstacles in the way and financial obstacles and they see all these opportunities with more well-funded areas of practice. And I, and I think just natural economic drift has, has seen some of the brightest and best candidates move away from criminal law, even though they might actually in, in their hearts want to do it, their heads and perhaps their parents are saying, you know what, it's, it, it, you're better off doing commercial law or, or something else. No, and I can completely vouch for that. I've got a friend who's a solicitor in London. He's just told me that he's got to move on from criminal law because he just can't afford to stay in criminal law. Um, and in my college at uh, Cambridge, we did a telephone, which is a fundraiser for a free places scheme. And I spoke to tens of uh, lawyers on the phone who were, who were alumni and not one of them was in was in criminal law, which is which is pretty you know, disappointing in terms of what the knock on must be when these are people who are going to be at the top of their fields. Um, and I guess as well, that's that's doubly linked with uh, it being more difficult for people from less well off backgrounds to get into the professions. So the representation is not there either. Yeah, I mean you're right on on both fronts. So you, you know we we have we have a you know you, you talk about Cambridge and C Cambridge alumni. Well, they're the exact group, of course, who are being so heavily recruited by the top city law firms and the US and, and other kind of elite world law firms, um, and and you know they are being taken away from criminal law, and, and that has an impact in a number of other ways. Yes, it has an impact on social mobility, particularly in criminal law, uh, which is you know never been great but but certainly isn't helped by all of these changes but also it has a big impact on the quality of the judiciary because you know the the generation of lawyers coming through now particularly barristers will make up the next generation of judges and if the brightest and the best are not going into criminal law then you know over time we just see a devaluation and a depreciation in the quality across the system um you know and i and i just think that that's that is it, it's it's something that we as a society are allowing to happen really without ever necessarily being asked to decide that that's what we want you know, I know that election after election, you know, governments come to power and the only mention of the justice system is, you know, we need tougher sentences on criminals or right. you know, we need more laws. We need to ban this or ban that. But, but you don't get a debate at election time around, you know, what's the state of our justice system? We, and, and no party goes into an election making it a significant priority to, you know, to spend money on bringing our justice system even back to where it was 25 years ago, let alone making it fit for the modern age, where there are so many more things that the justice system has to deal with. You know, if you think about internet-based fraud, which is now a massive part of our, uh, of, of our criminal justice system, you know, where's the resource to look into that? You know, most people who are victims of it 
you know, they, they, they report it, nothing happens because we just haven't resourced the system. Now, I just don't think most people probably understand how underfunded, uh, but, but equally importantly, how, uh, you know, badly run the criminal justice system has become in recent years. And, and, you know, we will pay a price for that as a society, as they have in the US, you know, where their system has been suffering from many of these structural or systemic problems for generations. And they, they are paying a very heavy price for that in terms of the cost of the system being astronomically high and in, in, and in terms of the fact that, you know, the fact that it simply doesn't achieve objective number one, which is to make society a safer place. You know, if you don't have a functioning and effective justice system, you just end up with this huge industrial prison complex, very high levels of crime, particularly violent crime and drug crime. And, and unfortunately, our sort of direction of travel is towards, you know, the, the, the US rather than towards some of the more enlightened thinking that we find in continental Europe. Mm. I mean, spoke recently to a former chief constable of Durham uh, Police Force, and he advocated for, you know, particularly for young people, out of court, community based uh, restorative justice disposals, which then doesn't criminalize the young person, you know, gives reparation to the victim, keeps them out of the court system, which I guess would then free up the courts to deal with the things that, that are backlogged. Would you take a view on that approach? Yes, I mean, and, and we, we share something in common because I interviewed him for my BBC series and he, and he is a voice in the wilderness in terms of, uh, well, I, I wouldn't say that's strictly true. There are a lot of senior police officers actually who are quite enlightened, but but having retired, he's a, he's got the freedom now to, 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 I mean, he talks about drug legalization, which is one of my passions. And he talks, as you say, about a, a much more pragmatic approach to uh, criminal uh, policy in particular, as it affects young people, children and young people who we still criminalize in our country from as young as 10 years old. Yeah. So, so, you know, we, I think that that, that that thinking is absolutely on the money. I mean, I wrote a whole chapter in my book about why children shouldn't be criminalized. Um, and, and, you know, as you, as you can imagine from, from the fact that I wrote in that way, that's a very important passion of mine because I think one of the major mistakes that we as a society perpetuate, and I, and I explain in the book that it's, it's been going on for a long time. You know, I talk about a mass hanging of eight-year-old children that took place only well, fewer than 200 years ago. We were hanging children in public as young wow. as eight years old for theft. So, so, you know, it really, you know, we, we, we've moved on from that. We're not doing that anymore, but, but it just shows you, you know, our attitude to criminalizing children is quite entrenched and it's been around for a long time. And, and the only consequence of criminalizing a child, um, assuming that you don't hang them in the street, is that they will, they will spend the rest of their life um, damaged by and often influenced and affected by that criminalization. Whereas if you didn't criminalize the same activity, in, particularly in the younger children of 10, 11, 12, um, you know, and, you, and you, you took a different approach, you took a welfare-based approach as they do in most of Europe, and indeed as the United Nations tell, tell us that we should, um, you know, then you would find that, that, that many of those children who are currently criminalized and then go on to become perpetual uh, you know, residents of one form of custodial institution or another uh, would, would, would actually get back on track and would, would re-engage with education and would, you know, uh, you know in, in many cases, end up leading a law-abiding life. But we, we just organise our system in a way which is so punitive. You know, and there's all sorts of cultural reasons for that. You know, we see it in the media. We see it in, you know, political discourse, uh, you know, where young people are often completely demonised uh, even though most of those who, who, who come into the criminal justice system uh, have backgrounds which are appalling, you know, in terms of the way they've been treated by the care system, uh, you know, the way that they may have been abused or otherwise mistreated by, by adults or carers of one kind or another. And, and yet they, they, they put a foot wrong and somehow they become, you know, these sort of media devils that, 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 that are just put up to be, to, to be abused and 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 to, and to and to be treated as um, as some sort of you know outcasts and and, and you know, if you if you do outcast children it's hardly surprising that they at some point um, you know take their revenge in adult life on on the society that's treated them that way but it's just bad policy and it, it, it's irrational policy because when you do treat children in a more humane way and in a pragmatic way the evidence is crystal clear you are much more likely to take them away from criminal behaviour and, and for them to end up as tax-paying, law-abiding citizens like everybody else. Mm. So I have a friend who, uh, she runs a company and they look after young people who are leaving the care system 
uh, and they are responsible for sort of supporting and overseeing that transition. Uh, and she mentioned that there's been, I think it was a change in the law, as she explained it, that historically young people in the care system, their records will be wiped of petty offences. And, and that, I believe, is now not the case. Um, well, you know, records, records are not wiped, I have to say, uh, and never have been. Um, they, 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 they should be, but, but we've never had a, a system in this country of, of wiping records or sealing them, as they might call it, in, mm. in the US. Um, if, if you know, I've had pe people uh, in their sixties, and it's popped up that they were done for shoplifting when they were fourteen. You know, many many years ago, uh, mm. and, and everything stays on the computer. And 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 you know, uh, yes, it's spent uh, it, under the Rehabilitation of Offenders Act, um, and that does mean that for most purposes, you know, juvenile convictions don't have to be declared on the employment application and so on. Um, but if someone ends up in trouble in later life or they end up coming to the attention of the police, you know, all of that is still on the computer. Mm. So, so we, we, you know, I, I, once again, one of the reasons why, you know, I just don't think we should criminalise children at all um, is because we, 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 you know, we are giving them a criminal record and it is permanent, even if it should be discounted and it should be ignored, it's still there. Whereas yeah. me, I think at the age of 18, but save for a tiny number of, children who, who who may genuinely be violent or represent a danger to the public i think almost all kind of criminal behavior as it's currently termed by children should simply be wiped off the system altogether at the age of 18 and they should be given a fresh start in adult life um, and i think that would be a, a big step forward in terms of um, uh, you know, stopping this, you know, complete staining of a young person's character and their whole life being dictated by something that happened often when they're very, very young and, and often in very difficult circumstances. I think that is the case, in, and particularly in the care system. You know, these are normally offences of assaults that happen during con control and restraint or um, criminal damage against the property in which they're housed. Uh, and, and surrounded by really complex circumstances. Well, drugs, the more, very commonly drugs offences. Um, you know, and that's another whole issue, which for me, you know, our criminal justice system and the approach to drug policy, to drug enforcement, and to the criminalisation of a small group of, um, a small portion of our society, predominantly young uh, men, predominantly in certain inner city areas, and predominantly from ethnic minorities. That, yep. that, that, that criminalization of, of, of low-level drug offending is, is, is genuine, genuinely one of the biggest problems in our society because, because it, it just leads to the marginalization of, of certain uh, parts of our society, which then excludes those young people from education often, from, from work life, and, and from you know, becoming uh, just part and parcel of the successful society that, that many, many people in our society enjoy. So I just think there's a whole range of areas, you know, as I described in the book, from drug policy to young people, and of course the overuse of custody. The, these things all link up together to, 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 to show you that, that our criminal justice system is driven by policy imperatives and policy considerations, which aren't pragmatic and rational. They're emotional, mm. they're emotional reactions to high profile cases or young people or, or, or people in the, in, in the criminal justice who have done something particularly um, nasty. And, and, you know, you can't make good policy by having an emotional reaction to a small number of high profile cases. Mm. Policy requires, good policy requires looking at the evidence for what actually works and what doesn't. And at the moment, we just ignore the evidence and do the opposite. And that's what I wanted to ask, actually, is, you know, we have um, QCs and, and senior lawyers such as yourself. We have, you know, people such as my friend who is, is a director of a company looking after young people every day. Uh, we have senior police officers, perhaps in an echo chamber, but all singing off the same song sheet. And yet the government seems to double down with this sort of punitive approach to let's lock up more people who are tough on crime when the data just doesn't support that. Why do you think that is, and, and how do we challenge that? How do we move forward on this? 
Well, I think I think it, the answer to that is quite straightforward because people vote for it. You know, mm. overwhelmingly at election time, um, those the, the party which uh, sounds toughest, even though toughness is a concept that doesn't really make any sense when you apply it to, to crime, because who cares whether you're tough or not? Surely, what matters is whether you reduce crime or not. That's more important than sounding or acting tough. Mm. Um, but the parties, you know, we had an election in 2019, as you know, December 2019, and 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 in that in the course of that election, uh, Boris Johnson and Priti Patel both went on the campaign trail advocating increased prison sentences, crackdowns on all sorts of different uh, perceived criminals, some real, some not, um, and you know, heavier penalties for drugs and heavier penalties for young people who, who, who commit certain types of crime. And what happened? They got a very large working majority in Parliament, you know. And even back in um, in 1990, uh, 1997, when Tony Blair's government uh, first came to power, um, you know, that they came to power and Tony Blair as a Labour um, um, leader came to power promising even tougher criminal justice policies than the Tories. So we, we'd come out of the Thatcher major era when, you know, there'd been lots of negativity around young offenders and lots of you know, crackdowns announced on various forms of crime. And the Labour government came into power and doubled down on that and increased the use of prison even more than any other government. So, so the short answer to your question is until the British public and the voting public decide that they're, they're, they're interested enough in criminal justice, and they have, you know, are willing to listen to more pragmatic and more, more, more practical ideas about how to change things, Politicians will just keep standing up at election time, saying the same old thing about crackdowns and getting tough. And sadly, people will keep voting for it. And there's nothing we can do in a democracy. What can we do other than try and make the case that that's wrong, that they've got it wrong? You know, what can we do? You know, election time, criminal justice policy is, is generally comes down to a binary choice between being perceived as being tough or not tough. That's all that seems to matter. And as long as that prevails, then nothing's going to change. And it seems to me, you know, the people who are disproportionately likely to be affected by crime are going to be living in poorer communities. Um, the government come with this message of tough on crime, equaling longer sentences without tackling the root cause, including poverty. And what, what that message really is, is we're going to tackle poverty. Sorry, we're going to tackle crime by locking up your son. So I think it's really important, the message that you've been giving out via your books and, and via your sort of TV series as well. Um, we've, we've touched on drugs a couple of times, and this is one of the questions that one of the, the young men on the group asked. So perhaps now's a, a good time to, to go there. This morning I spoke to um, Dr. Um, David Arezzo, who is the, um, now then let me get his title correct. He is the clinical director and deputy head of the Center for Psychedelic Research. So obviously that's a bit of an aside. It's an application of drugs in a positive way for mental health. Um, mm. But I think the, the, the point there is that often legality and morality are not matched and legality and harm don't go hand in hand either. What is your, your take on the war on drugs? Uh, has it failed and where should we go with that? Well, it's failed because you can't you can't really have a war with with a substance. It doesn't make any sense. You can you, you, the war ends up being not on drugs but on people, yeah. uh, and and on and on our communities and our society. So you know it's it's a civil war that's been created, and I explain the history in some detail in the book as to you know if we if we go back to the late Victorian era, what many people won't realise is that Queen Victoria and Winston Churchill, you know, two individuals, you couldn't think of two more high profile examples of proper British behaviour. Well, they used to do coke together, you know, and and, 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 and at the time that was completely acceptable. You know, Queen Victoria was also, uh, also took cannabis and, and various other drugs. And, and, and they weren't illegal at the time, they weren't prohibited. And it was, you know, many of them were only accessible to the more wealthy people in society. But the point being, there's nothing morally, independently morally wrong with drugs. What's wrong is, when you put a label of something being prohibited on a substance, you create this enormous criminal infrastructure around it. And also mm. the, the other side of the criminal infrastructure is all this law enforcement and justice infrastructure. So, so what happened in the early 1970s, you had Richard Nixon, who was relatively newly elected US president, and he decided that he was going to launch a war on drugs. And he brought everybody al along with him. He brought the British government to bring in the Misuse of Drugs Act in the early 70s. And one of the most catastrophic statistics that I think anyone that kind of is, has any doubt about the impact of prohibition, 
just before um, the misuse of drugs that came into force in Britain, we had one of the most enlightened policies around heroin abuse or heroin addiction in the world. It was called the British system. And, and those who had a problem with heroin could get prescription heroin from a doctor uh, and their, you know, they could carry on with their lives. They didn't have to go and rob people to pay for it. You know, it was all, uh, it, was, it was very medicalized. Then the misuse of drugs that came in and all of that was scrapped. But at that point in time, we had around a thousand heroin addicts in Britain. Within a decade of the misuse of drugs that coming into force, by the early 1980s, we had 300,000 problem heroin addicts, all of whom were buying their drugs entirely from a criminal black market, which had grown exponentially in a decade to a huge market. We had drug deaths, we had turf wars, we had overdoses, we had all manner of criminal activity, which stemmed from only one thing, and that was the passing of the Misuse of Drugs Act. It was nothing to do with the drug itself. We mm -hmm. managed perfectly well up until then to keep heroin use fairly well contained and not sort of having a, 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 an adverse impact on society in any significant way. Even the users of heroin under the British system who got their heroin on prescription, most of them lived a law-abiding life. They went to work, they went to college, they did, they did all the normal things. It was, you know, only the prohibition of, of, of the drug, which then led to a skyrocketing in the price because it was so much money to be made by criminals and, and an enormous explosion in drug-related crime, burglary mm. and robbery and all manner of other crimes. And, and of course, sex work um, in many cases for more vulnerable people, you know, to, for whom that was the only option in terms of uh, getting the money to, 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 you know, hundreds and hundreds of pounds a week uh, to fund a heroin addiction. So, you know, you, 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 if, you, if you talk about 1,000 to 300,000 in a decade, then we had the whole of the 80s with the crack explosion, the crack epidemic, all of that traces back to the Misuse of Drugs Act, and all of that traces back ultimately to Richard Nixon, who ironically was a completely discredited president who had to resign because of a massive scandal. And you can blame him for all of it because he was he was ultimately behind it. But but we as the British, you know, you know, trying to find our way in the world after much of our authority had seeped away after the Second World War, we just went along with it. And and I'm afraid we're still going along with it because our politicians still think that there's mileage in in, in treating drugs and the stuff that comes in a pack or grows on a, on a tree or a bush as somehow inherently wrong and evil and morally wrong. And it just doesn't make any sense. I know why is oregano inherently more moral than cannabis? It doesn't make any sense. It just grows. It's a green thing that grows out of the ground. So, so you know, the law is trying to treat substances as somehow having a moral quality, which they don't have. Only human behavior has moral qualities, uh, but we've legislated in a way that, that you know, is so mistaken. Um, and it's the one thing, when often I get asked, you know, what's the one thing you'd change? It, it, the one thing I would change is I would legalize license and regulate drug supply. Because if you did that, I think many, many other criminal justice issues would um, would disappear. Yeah, and, and we know that that's you know, happened in Portugal along with lots of, sort of health issues and addiction issues uh, hand in hand. Um, I know we're getting fairly short of time now. There's a couple of quick questions I wanted to ask you. Uh, one of them is around something you tweeted earlier uh, about um, offences being publicised before someone has been found guilty. Uh, the reason I ask about this, there were uh, five young men that I was aware of from my hometown. They went camping during lockdown due to home pressures. Uh, they had a campfire, it got out of control. They were charged by the police uh, because there had been other arsons that had not been solved, it seems. Um, and ultimately, they ended up in the Crown Court. Uh, the judge invited an application to dismiss, and it was dismissed. In the meanwhile, the police had put their names, ages, addresses on Facebook as being charged with arson. Uh, it also then, obviously, the press picked that up. Uh, and so despite the charges being dropped or, or no evidence being offered in court, they're all over the internet. So when a new employer Googles their names, the first thing that comes up is, is arson. So I've spent the last two days emailing editors and speaking with the police, and, and, and luckily that's been able to be removed. Mm. Do you think that the police should so be criticising. They, they were children, or they were over eighteen. They were over eighteen. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, I think I think there is an argument. I mean, they, 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 there is a there is an argument for certainly for for higher levels of anonymity around uh, young, very much so for younger people. And of course, there already are rules around children not being not being named without the judge's permission. Mm. Um, and, and I think that that you know we've just seen a Supreme Court judgment which allows really wealthy celebrities to get court orders to to prevent their names and their details being 
publicised, but that's not really available to most people. And that's why I think there's been some criticism of that judgment or, or, or because it gives one law for the rich who can, you know, it arises out of the Cliff Richard case and various other high profile cases of that kind. Um, but, I, but I have to say, I think generally speaking, if someone's been charged and the case is going to court, I'm in favour of of open justice, and I am in favour of, of being able to see what happens in in the, in the courts. Mm. Um, whether or not there should be a, a time limit on publicity or the length of time things can remain available on Google, we do have a right to forget, and and you know mm. those things have come through the European jurisprudence. But but I think you know it, it is very unfortunate when, if particularly if a case is dropped and then there, there's no convictions, if all of that publicity remains. But I, I, I just think the horse has bolted. I think now, you know, with the internet, you know, it's really impossible for anyone who's sort of made a mistake in inverted commas and it, and it finds its way into some sort of media outlet. It's, it's all very, very difficult for that person to avoid the, the publicity continuing um, for a very long time. Um, but I wouldn't be in favour of, you know, a blanket ban on naming anybody that's in the criminal justice system until the end of the case, because that just would prevent the public from really seeing what was going on. And I think the public are already deprived of accurate information about what's going through the justice system. I think removing and anonymizing all defendants in the courts pre-conviction would just mean that the public would, would never hear anything about what was going on in court. And, and I don't think that's good in a, in a society which is, you know, which is very much about the sort of open justice that allowed me to go and sit in that public gallery and watch cases, you know, as, as a teenager. I think the public who are reading newspapers or watching television are equally entitled. Um, I think there's a there's an argument about the responsibility of journalists, but 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 they're certainly yeah. entitled to know what's going on. Uh, but that does make, I'm afraid, for some cases where completely innocent people have their names dragged through the mud. Um, sadly, I think that's a price we have to pay for an open justice system occasionally. Um, but but I, but you know, I completely sympathise with those who, who who face those sorts of issues. It's it's not it, it's an awful thing, and I've seen it myself with clients, you know, who've been dragged through the media and then found not guilty, and no one even reports the fact that they were found not guilty in the end. Yeah, and, and perhaps there's a you know there there should be some obligation on editors and on the police if they're going to post that to keep it up to date, follow through, uh, and and make sure those articles are or current in what in what they're saying. Um, We've run out of time. Final, very final question, if if you're able. Uh, and this is just to do with equality of access to justice. Um, there's been a number of occasions through the Lads Advice Group and through my research where I've ended up in the police station or in court with particularly young men who, had I not been there and, and able to appropriately challenge what they were being told or you know that 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 power imbalance that exists, then outcomes would have been very different. Um, do you have any advice if you're someone who has been arrested? Uh, and and you've not been you know, in contact with the police before about what your actions should be. You you have to get you have to get a solicitor. So you you're entitled if you're arrested and taken to a police station. You're absolutely entitled to the duty solicitor who may may not nowadays be a solicitor. In fact, they may be a a, a trained you know representative rather than someone who's actually a qualified lawyer. But but you just have to get some advice because the the what the one thing you can guarantee is that if you, it, particularly as a young person, particularly if you maybe don't have all of the skills that uh, you know to navigate these situations. Uh, but even if you're not, even even very clever people, once they're faced with um, you know being arrested and the, the stress and panic that goes with that, can often do and say the most stupid of things. So number one piece of advice, if you're arrested unexpectedly uh, or, or at all, in fact, get some legal advice and listen to it carefully, and and just make sure that you make decisions based on that advice and don't don't act out of emotion or other 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 immediate kind of fear or panic or worry and start saying things. Keep keep your powder dry in terms of what you're saying to the police until you've had some proper legal advice, and that will hopefully mean that the worst kind of uh, things that can happen at police stations won't happen to you. I know there have been a couple of occasions where people have been advised to take caution, and they've also been advised, well, you're innocent, it's going to take another few hours to get legal representation, you may as well just speak to us if you're, if you're innocent. What would you say to that? Uh, uh, well, th th that is a, a, an old trick that sometimes uh, police officers who are keen to, to clear something up or get someone to confess, if you like, you know, they do play the whole, you know, it's going to be a while before the lawyer comes, just wait for the lawyer. Just, just, just don't, don't, don't take any notice of that. It, it is true that sometimes there's a long wait for the duty solicitor for various reasons, but you know you're you're much better off in the long run 
sitting in the cell for however long it takes for the lawyer to come than going into an interview without one. Brilliant. Chris, it's been an absolute pleasure to speak to you. Thanks ever so much for giving up the time. Um, if people want to uh, follow your progress views, have you got yes. any publications? Yes. Or more than welcome. We mentioned my YouTube channel, Chris Dor QC on YouTube. They can follow me on Twitter, which is at CrimLawUK, uh, or they can follow me or, on uh, LinkedIn, where there's, there's I often post about more professional issues Twi twitter they'll get some legal comment or comment on all sorts of things but uh but yeah they can follow me across those three platforms um and as i say youtube in particular some great advice and some great uh, videos for young people looking to, to to get into the law so i hope i hope you know many of your listeners will will check it out fantastic that's been really interesting and really useful thanks ever so much chris and uh take, take care. care thank take you care. you too thanks for joining us for this episode of got your six lads advice encounters with me gav topley and friends as always, if you'd like to contact us, you can do so by emailing ladsadvice at hotmail.com, by commenting on the group on Facebook, Lads Advice, by checking out our Insta, Lads underscore advice, or our Twitter, advice underscore lads. You can support our fundraising for papyrus prevention of young suicides, which we have a £20,000 target, by sponsoring us at www.justgiving.com forward slash fundraising forward slash Chaz and Gab smash Kelly. Finally, if you'd like to support the podcast and the Facebook group, you can do so on patreon.com forward slash Thanks for listening and we'll see you next week.